In this fourth part of my Ancient Civilizations series, I will look at Rome's interactions with the world, but I will begin with a quotation from Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. Come, let's have one other gaudy night. Call to me all my sad captains. Fill our bowls once more. Let's mock the midnight bell. Mark Antony speaks these lines at the end of Act 3, on the night before a battle with his erstwhile ally, Octavian, and they represent the decadence and decline of Roman virtue in the presence of the East, particularly Egypt, embodied in the form of Queen Cleopatra. Plutarch's treatment of Cleopatra, on which Shakespeare's play is based, however, is sympathetic. On the one hand, Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra is a revisiting of the romance genre began in Romeo and Juliet, but on the other, a gripping political epic about the threat posed to the Roman state by desire and earthly pleasures on the Nile. The story of Rome and Cleopatra does not begin with Antony and Octavian's conflict as played out in the Shakespeare play. In fact, it goes back to before the action of Julius Caesar. Cleopatra's rise to prominence in world history began with her role in the siege of Alexandria. When Caesar first arrived in Egypt, he was in pursuit of his enemy and former triumvirate partner Pompey, and was presented with his severed head. It is recorded that he shed tears on receiving this gift, perhaps out of sadness for his death in and of itself, but perhaps also because it dramatically reduced the chances of his reintegrating Pompey's supporters after his defeat. Caesar, however, wasted no time in bringing Egypt under his control, and took the then king Ptolemy hostage, who promised to pay the debts of his father's Roman loans. Occupying the city of Alexandria provoked riots because Caesar refused to leave until full repayment. Determined to solve the crisis, Cleopatra, Ptolemy's sister, smuggled herself into the palace in a laundry basket. She and Caesar soon began a romantic relationship, and he agreed to let her rule as co-monarch with her brother, as their father had intended. As a gesture of goodwill, Caesar released Ptolemy, who immediately began to raise an army against his sister and the Romans. The Battle of the Nile ensued, which Cleopatra and Caesar won. The latter lingered in Egypt and witnessed the birth of his son by the former. Germany was not a unified entity and would not become one until 1871. Instead, the area was populated by Germanic tribes who resisted the incursions of the Romans. Julius Caesar's crossing of the Rhine is considered one of the highlights of his military career, even if he turned straight back. One of the major sources we have on those early Germans is from Tacitus, who described them with admiration, both in terms of physical prowess and strength of character. He also describes a decisive battle that took place between the Romans and Germans at Teutoburg Forest, which discouraged further attempts by Rome to expand north. His account was highly influential well into the 20th century in creating a German racial archetype of an honourable, oath-bound, chaste and Aryan people. Before the Romans visited Britain, they considered it a quasi-mythological place. They didn't know if it was an island or a continent. They told tales that the Gauls ferried their dead across the channel, like the Grey Havens in Tolkien's Middle Earth. The ancient British Isles were inhabited by Celtic peoples, the Picts in Scotland, the Britons in England and Wales, and the Gaels in Ireland. Later, the Anglo-Saxons arrived and settled much of England. They spoke a West Germanic dialect that has evolved into English. The Roman Empire included England and Wales, from the 1st century until the beginning of the 5th century AD. They were never able to gain a foothold in Scotland. Around the year zero, China and Rome were connected by a trading route called the Silk Road, but whether they came into direct contact is debated. At the time, China was ruled by the Han Dynasty. It was the world's most populous state, and one-fifth of the global population today claim Han Chinese ancestry. The Chinese had heard of the Romans, and considered them as their western equals. The Romans, however, thought the Chinese inferior and associated their luxuries with immorality and decadence. Although the two empires were aware of each other, they did not meet directly. Instead, each entity's knowledge of the other was filtered through intermediaries, such as the Persians. Before the Romans and Chinese, 
Alexander the Great had conquered parts of India, so east-west encounters had a precedent. There were rumoured expeditions by both parties, but the great powers of Rome and China declined into Byzantium and the Three Kingdoms respectively. Byzantium is what the Roman Empire eventually evolved into. It was established as a Christian entity by Emperor Constantine in 330 AD and stretched from southern Russia to the Nile, with its capital at Constantinople, which is modern-day Istanbul. Byzantium was Rome's heir, but it also sought to fuse Greek and Roman culture with an emerging Christianity. Shifting east was logical for Constantine, because there was great wealth to be had there from major urban centres compared with the more rural west. Constantinople was also more defensible against eastern enemies, and was in the middle of intellectually flourishing cultures to the south in Alexandria and the east in Persia. Before Constantine's conversion, Christians in the Roman Empire were persecuted for their faith. Now, with the integration of certain pre-Christian practices, it was the official state religion. The story is far more complicated than that, though, and will be dealt with in more detail through the next module. But suffice to say, this was a major change in the history of the Western world.